the McKinsey Historical Museum. And uh, my name is Andy Thomas, and I think most of y'all know me. And uh, so uh, we're really looking forward to having um, Dr. Stroop um, speak about the railroad heritage in South Carolina. And I want to do an introduction for Dr. Stroop. Um, I mean, thank you so much for being gracious enough to come and speak tonight. He is a native of St. Louis, Missouri, graduated from Lawford College in 1968, and he served two years in the U.S. Army, including 12 months in South Korea. Um, he was with the, uh, he was a communications officer for the 122nd Single Battalion, 2nd Infantry Division. He attended graduate school at the University of South Carolina, receiving a Master of Arts degree in 1974 and a PhD in 1980. Dr. Street's areas of concentration included cultural and social history of the South. From 1974 to 1979, he served as the first professional director of the Historic Columbia Foundation. He served for 18 years at the State Museum as curator of history, chief curator, and deputy director for collections and interpretation. In 1997, he became the director of the South Carolina Department of Archives and History a position that also includes serving as a State Historic Preservation Officer. He retired in 2009, and since that time continues to volunteer at, a local, at local historic organizations, including serving as a superintendent of the Rockton, Rhine, and Western Railroad, which is an operating tourist uh, railroad um, located in Winsboro, South Carolina. That's where the South Carolina uh, Museum for Railroads is located. And um, in 2019, he published the book, Meet Me at the Rocket, A History of the South Carolina State Fair, which is a great book if you haven't read it. It's got some big pictures in it and all that kind of stuff. And uh, Dr. Streep has also served in numerous community and professional organizations. He served as president of the Historic Columbia Foundation, the Shandon Neighborhood Council, and the Richmond County Historic Preservation Commission. His professional environment uh, included serving on the Council of the American Association for State and Local History, as a member of the National Historic Public Records Commission, president of the South Carolina Federation of Museums, and chairman of the South Carolina Hall of Fame. So let's welcome Dr. Street for his presentation tonight on railroads. I did a couple of Zoom and didn't like them. It's like talking to a box or something, you know, because you can't see people's faces. Um, so I'm thankful and thank you for inviting me to do this live so I can hopefully get back to having a do of these because I love nothing more than talking about railroads and my wife gets tired of it. So um, what we're going to do is kind of look quickly at the heritage of South Carolina, kind of looking at what's gone and what's still here. Um, we always like to start out by saying that when railroads started, South Carolina was a leading in that area in terms of many firsts. We got about nine or ten firsts from South Carolina. I'm not going to go over all of them. Um, one of them is the Best Friend Locomotive, which was the first American-built locomotive to run passenger service on a regular schedule in this country. And that was in 1831-1832. It was the first fatality in a, in a railroad accident that happened in June of 1831 when the fireman tied the uh, escape valve closed on the best friend and exploded and killed him and injured about two or three bystanders, including the engineer. Um, this is the best friend, the two best friends, one of them in the State Museum and one of them was in a museum in Charleston, which I'll show you pictures of later. But this is it in 1928. Uh, it was built by Southern Railroad as a uh, re reproduction in 1928, and they traveled around the country to celebrate their centennial. They trace their heritage back to the original South Carolina Railroad as well. I think this is from Georgetown. It was the first um, railroad to have an articulated locomotive, and what that means is it bends in the middle, which means it can go around steeper curves. And we don't have them much in this part of the country, but when steam locomotives were around, they were very, very important, and particularly the, the western part going through the Rocky Mountains, trying to get through those as well. Um, the first railroad to carry the United States mail was the Charleston Hamburg Railroad. You might hear it called the South Carolina Railroad. Railroad names, if you think your genealogy is tough, 
railroad names will drive you nuts trying to keep up with what railroad to get, what railroad to merge with which railroad to get, what railroad. So um, I just use the term Charleston and Hamburg. That's the name of the book that really deals with it by Tom Fetter. This is a 1924 mail car that's up at the railway museum in Winsboro that we have. I don't have any pictures from 1820s or 30s when they first started moving the mail around. Um, when it was completed in 1834, the Charleston and Hamburg from Charleston to Hamburg, South Carolina, North Augusta now, uh, was 134 miles long, and for a number of years it was the longest railroad in the, in the country. Um, it quickly got taken over by others as well. The first railroad junction in, South, in the country was at Branchville, when in 1836 they branched off to come to Columbia, finally got to Columbia in 1842. But that connection from 1836 was the first railroad junction um, at Branchville. Um, just to give you an idea of how many railroad mileage there were in the state, from uh, 1840 there were about 153 miles. Basically, it's the Charleston and Hamburg Railroad with the line to Columbia was 153 miles. By 1860, there was 1985. You can see the peak is 1920 with 3,950 miles. And then by 2007, it's down to about 2,404, 1,500 miles less track. And I know there's less than that. 2007 was the last numbers I could find um, in the Office of Regulatory State of Computing Records. Because um, I know there's other railroads that are close, because I'm going to show you some of them. This gives you an idea of 1920, um, just how the railroads are. And I do want to point out that the Rockman and Ryan is right here. And it is on that map. Uh, it was a 12 mile short line. I'll talk a little bit more about toward the end of the program as well. But you can see the lines here. The uh, main lines running with Atlantic Coast Line, Southern Railway, and Seaboard Airline. Those were the three main lines in 1920, both carrying heavy freight as well as passengers. 1920, there were about 270 scheduled trains a day through Columbia. Um, that includes freight and passenger trains, and it includes some locals. But that's the number that John Montgomery came up with that I found. 270? 270 scheduled trains a day. Wow. So that's how, think about 1920 in terms of roads. I mean, if you went somewhere, you went by train. Because if you look at 1920s or 20s to 30s map, what you see is dirt roads and then the paved roads spread out like spokes on the wheel from Sumter and Florence and Columbia and Charleston. You connect up so to get through. So you could go from Columbia to anywhere in the country, anywhere in the state in about three hours by train um, in 1920. So that's kind of amazing when you think about it. Um, passenger service was important. This is the last run of the Carolina Special which ran from Charleston to Asheville. Started in 1911 and continued to operate until 1968. This is not the last run. This is an article that was in the state newspaper that I picked up on. It showed this is a typical E unit, which they used on those months. At Walford, I used to watch them go by. I was at Walford 64 to 68. I could time sometimes what time they were going by as they came by the dormitory that I lived in at Walford. So what happened to that 1,546 miles of track that was taken up? Well, most of the track was scrapped. And the roadbeds, most of them have just become overgrown. Um, but a few of them have gone into rails to trails. Now, railroaders are not really wild about rails to trails, but it's better than nothing. Um, so it's there. But there's, these are the ones that are still in South Carolina. And you can find these by Google and Shotgun Rails to Trails. But just an example of a couple of them. This is in the Hitchcock Woods in, uh, in Aiken, South Carolina. And this is where the original roadbed for the South Carolina Railroad originally ran. The Southern Railway moved, moved the roadbed over a little ways. But this is still there and it's still a walking trail. This is what many of those look like, just abandoned. You can see a little piece of track right here. This is the end of the Rock and the Ryan Railroad, which has not been yet restored for passenger service on it yet. We ride motor cars out there, um, but we, don't, we can't take the big trains out there. And uh, we just try to keep the grass down and make it look like we care and they're coming in and taking a look at it. Can't talk about railroads when we sat in South Carolina without talking about the Port Royal Railroad. This ran from Port Royal through Beaufort, which is right there together, of course, um, out to Yamasee, which was a connection with what was the Seaboard Airline 
main line uh, from Miami to New York. Um, this railroad was built in the 1870s. There's a great article in the Southland Historical Magazine called Dark and Dusty Going to Augusta. Um, all the railroads get nicknames of some variety or another. So it ran from Port Royal out to Augusta, North Augusta, actually. This is the railroad. This is a photograph I took about 2008 or 9, maybe. Um, this is Seabrook, and there were lots of truck farms along the way, so that was one of the things that the railroad did. Late 90s, the railroad was sold um, in, uh, to the state of South Carolina. The state continued to run until Mark Sanford closed the port at Port Royal. When the port closed, the railroad had no need to exist anymore, so the property was bought by the Buford Water, Buford Jasper Water and Sewer Authority. Um, they were going to run sewer lines along it and the hiking trails. Um, then they decided not to do that, um, so they sold the track, just the track, to a company for three million dollars for scrap, so they took up the 25 miles of track. And after they took up the 25 miles of track, it looked like that, they planned to put in hiking and biking trails and they got into legal problems because many of the tracts of land they thought they owned, they didn't own, they had a railroad right away. Once the railroad's gone, the right away goes away. Mm -hmm. So it would become a mess. There are parts of the trail in downtown Buford, um, around the Buford Depot, down in Port Royal, and some of the silk tent would have made a great tourist railroad um, on there. This is my $85 photograph of the last of the track being taken up as the train goes in there and Amtrak heading north east. I was heading to Buford for a meeting and when I went by and looked over and saw this, I said, I've got to get a picture. The train was not there. I came back. It came back 50 miles an hour in a 35 mile an hour zone and Barney died. So that's my $85 photograph. <laughs> But fortunately, the people that do for the Jasper Water and Tour Authority were really good. Now, that may go down with um, a couple of motor cars, including mine, which is this one, and an M19, two M19s and a truck. And we videoed the whole railroad as much as we could get to it in one day. But you'll notice on the way back, we got caught in a humongous thunderstorm. <laughs> and we were soaked. But we've got the photographs, and we've got a great video documenting it. Well, let's come back to Columbia. Um, some things are gone. Y'all recognize that? You've been in Columbia and make the time you recognize it. This was the track that went, this is a seaboard track that went to the seaboard station, which is now the Blue Marlin. Um, the trestle that the city took down overnight, sort of, more or less, um, kind of just disappeared. Um, and uh, the track is, is gone. This is what it looked like. And actually, I'm standing probably in the middle of the Colonial Life Center. When, I, when this photograph was taken 30 or 40 years ago, this, I picked this up online. It's the great, best picture I found of the trestle because nobody had time to document it before. I mean, the city just really went after it quickly and got it taken down pretty quickly. Um, this is in the walkway, the covered walkway outside the Blue Marlin, which is right here, which was the Seaboard Depot. Um, burned and it's been rebuilt, basically. It looks the same. Had a great diner here as well, I understand. But this goes all the way across Gervais Street, and so when the trains came in, um, passenger trains, they blocked Gervais Street. And we have at the railroad museum that one of the stop signs that somebody would stand in the street and hold up to stop the traffic in there. So um, great stories as well. And this is before they have, they've actually paved this now, and it's been lighted and so forth. This was before that, and you can see the tunnel. This is what it looked like in 1917. So the track's gone, the trains are gone from there, but there's still railroad heritage and there's some signage along there as well. And wonderful cover place to eat outdoors in nice weather in Columbia as well. Another railroad you can't help but talk about in terms of heritage is the Piedmont Northern, which ran from Greenwood up to Anderson and then over to Greenville and down to Spartanburg. This was the only electric interurban railroad in South Carolina. In the north, they were extremely common. This is a typical concept. The railroad was built in the early 20th century, operated up into the mid-1960s. Some of the track is still extant, uh, being used by CSX. Um, they operated electrically until uh, the late 1950s. They had a couple of diesel locomotives. They had continued operating into the early 60s. But that was Piedmont and Northern. Great story, a great book out about it as well if you're interested. 
But one of the things that's left standing more than anything else is depots and stations. Um, there's a book published by John Gilbert in, 19, in 2000, in, in 2000 um, called South Carolina Railroad Stations. And uh, in there, he's got maps. This is a combined map of seaboard, southern, and Atlantic coastline um, and depots. And I've counted this several times and come up somewhere with a number around 360 depots or stations or places where there are depots or stations or stops as well um, on the line. Of course, the depots were in the small towns. This is Lane, South Carolina, by the way, which is in Williamsburg County. Um, this is an early 20th century photograph. The depots were the center of town and community life in many ways, if you think about it. If you're going somewhere, you went by train. If you had something delivered, it came by train. The newspapers came by train, so when somebody was there, if there was news, they were waiting for the newspaper to get thrown off the train. And there was usually some sort of community center somewhere around in there. So they, they played a very important part of life, particularly in rural South Carolina. Um, so Lane Station, that's no longer the sand. This is Austin. This is one of my favorite photographs. This is Austin. And you see these ladies are selling pies on the train. And I don't have time to talk about dining cars and eating on the train. I've got a whole program I do on that. But um, that used to be one way that people would be able to eat in, before dining cars um, was to have people at the station sell food one way or another. Austin's on the Southern Railroad line up to Spartanburg, goes up the Broad River. Uh, it's part of the Palmetto Trail, actually. The Palmetto Trail runs not too far from, from Austin. Um, this is Charleston. Um, this, is a 19, this is a 1970s photograph of there's a huge depot complex in Charleston. I'm going to show you several pictures of it. All this dates pre-war, pre-Civil War. Only been one war in South Carolina. We say before the war, that's the only war we're talking about. So this is this is um, from the early 70s. This is what it looked like in a drawing that's um, in the best train museum in Charleston. Um, the train's actually back down here. If you've been down there and you're familiar with this at all, there's a children's museum. It's part of it. The Children's Museum is in this part of it over here, and there are restaurants and some shops along this side of it. Here it is from the parking garage. Parking garages are a great place to take pictures from. And the trains were, originally in the 1850s, the trains would back in here to a building I'll show you in a minute, which was an enclosed building. They could back in and load in those buildings there. And this is that building. It's now the Charleston Music Hall. Originally, these were open. But they closed them, I and that lasted for a couple of years. And that back and then got old and took up too much time, too much smoke and steam, and all coming out of the trains for the people in downtown Charleston. So they stopped that <coughs> after moving the depots further out. This is the current Welcome Center in Charleston. If you've been in the Welcome Center, uh, this is the building next door to it, where you board the buses and all for the tours. This is the other side of that same building. These were all built prior to the war. This is, a, this is the warehouse, the Chaplin Railroad Museum, Chaplin Railroad Warehouse. Across the street, this is next to this thing. And one of the great things we have at the Railroad Museum, thanks to the Charleston folks, at the Charleston, Rail, Charleston National Railroad Historical Society, um, this, is a, this is a downspout. You have, to, you have to have good imagination, but this is the downspout where the drain goes down. This is what would be up in the corner of the, um, of the building. And of course, it says, SCRR, South Carolina Railroad, 1858. We, it didn't come off of one of the existing buildings. It must have come off of a building that's no longer extant. Um, and I've worked with the Charleston folks, and we can't find a photograph of a building or anyway. There's two of these. We have one, the other one is in the Best Friend Museum in Charleston. Everybody knows California Dreaming, 1900 by Frank Milburn. Um, the depot, Union, Union Station, it was called Union Station because it was used by more than one railroad. It was used by the Atlantic Coast Line and it was used by the, uh, the Southern Railway. So it's called Union Station. That's what Union means on it as well. Great adaptive use. And unless you're trying to eat lunch from the universities in session, and you just have to stand in line. Um, but uh, it works real. And occasionally, I've been eating in there and a train goes by. <clears throat> What's not still standing from that station's use 
is this bridge which used to go across the railroad track. This is Assembly Street up over. This was torn down in 1957. Think of it, 270 trains a day through Columbia, many of those on this track, blocking traffic on Assembly Street. So they built a wooden bridge up over the top of it. Um, and I, I don't know when it was, I haven't been able to find when it was built, but I know it was torn down in 1957. Um, so it was there for quite a while. Now you just stop the traffic. And of course, today the trains are longer, much longer. So they take much longer to go by. This is a station in Charleston built in 1907 and then burned in 1947. Um, Charleston was working to keep up with the grand stations like New York and Chicago and St. Louis. Um, on a one step down from those, not quite as grand as those, but certainly working to keep in that direction as well. You see the, just the corner of the trolley car and dropping somebody off at the depot. And then there's stations like Chapel. This is much more common. Chapel is over toward um, Greenwood as you get over that direction toward Greenwood from here. Um, typical station with both a, a, a freight platform on it as well as a, a passenger. Um, platforms as well. You see a couple cars sitting back there. This one is Prosperity. That's still there. That's been repainted recently. And it's a community center. And it sits us beside. This is not an active track anymore. The main track from for the southern, southern, north, southern goes behind um, some buildings over there away. So the track's about a quarter mile away. So this is not an active track any longer. This is Cowpens. Um, this is an original photograph from the 1960s. Carol, Indiana has a collection of about a thousand photographs from a man named Ben Roberts from Augusta, Georgia, who was a railroad worker who took photographs. And when he was getting younger, when he sold them to Carol, Indiana, and uh, their railroad one section is a county is a railroad station, and that's where most of these pictures were taken in the 60s. This is right beside the main line of Southern Railway. Um, the railroads don't like to leave the station city there and be used, particularly on active track, because of the possibility of a derailment. You know, you got a meeting going on in there and people in there, and then half four or five cars go through that. Not good, not good for liability insurance. So many times they have sold the stations, or in this case, they gave it to the city town and count pens. They moved it about 100 yards away from the track back turned it into a senior citizen center, put in a handicapped accessible ramp, and all those things. Those kinds of things have happened in a number of places around South Carolina. Uh, we've lost a lot of depots that the railroads, the towns just couldn't come up with the money to move them. The cost of moving the stations is pretty extensive. This is Aiken. Um, this one turned into a dry cleaners, and it's now a parking lot for Piedmont Tech. Um, when it closed. This is Lockhart. Um, this is gone, but it was an American Legion hut for a while after it was a railroad depot. Uh, this is also Edgefield, and it is gone. This is the other depot in Edgefield. This is Dillon. This is one of my favorites because it's got lots of interesting things. It's got an M19 sitting in front of it. Uh, this is a photograph from post-1970. I'm not sure exactly when it was taken, but it's got an Amtrak sign on it, so it's got to be after 1970. So it's got that. It's got the little motor car, a close-up of the motor car. And it's, current, it's still a current Amtrak station. You can pick up and board an Amtrak train on the main north-south line, which runs through Florence and Dillon. Um, and they run during the day, not in the middle of the night, like the one train each way that runs through Columbia um, as well. So this is a big little station. This is my favorite station in South Carolina, and I'll tell you why. This is Ulmer, South Carolina, which is on the seaboard line down towards Savannah. Um, it went through, and this is a photograph from John Gilbert's book, and there as well. But notice it's got the little bay window, so the station master could look down the track as well. And it's got two waiting rooms. It may have had three waiting rooms. I haven't been able to determine that yet. Um, notice this door right here. That you can't hardly see this sign, but it says colored 
intrastate, intrastate, not interstate, but intrastate, which means riding within the state. When the civil rights movement started in the 40s, when the African-American soldiers came back from World War II, we started to ask for rights and move things. Many states passed laws about passenger trains and having to keep in the back of the bus separate cars on trains, not being able to even design a car, and the laws were restrained. So when you got to the South Carolina border, you would have to change cars if you were an African American and you were traveling in, say, Virginia or Maryland, and you were allowed to sit in the car with the whites. So it came as a great book by a professor at the University of California, Berkeley, on the whole African American experience. And when I sent him this picture, he went ballistic. He was just excited about it. Interstate means that if you're staying within the state, that's the waiting room. So I know there's a white waiting room, but is there also a waiting room for African Americans that are riding interstate? I don't know. This station is long gone, so I'm um, not sure if they'll ever be able to find out. But just a, interesting, because you all know that all the stations had white waiting rooms and colored waiting rooms. That was pretty standard um, starting in the 1890s. And I put Asher to me because it's kind of interesting that many times, as I mentioned, trying to figure out how many actual depots or buildings were there, it's hard to figure out. So here's the passenger depot at Asher Food. Here's the freight depot. Um, this is long gone. Both of them are long gone, long gone. This one's been gone even longer, probably. Um, Kingville, South Carolina. Anybody know where that is? Little Richland County, going down toward, uh, go across the river to Assumption, to, to Assumption, um, down there. And it was a major uh, interchange point for railroads. Um, beginning in the 1830s and 40s, we find travelers talking about Kingville and talking about the activities that went on there and changing trains there. There is nothing there except the historical marker. I've gotten out of the car and walked around not on railroad property. Um, can't find a footing or anything, so I don't know where the depot was actually located. But uh, that's an amazing story when you think about it. This is um, Columbia. This is the work um, station in Columbia, which had a roundhouse. You can see there probably 10 or 12 bays for locomotives to go in. They push the locomotives in and work on There's a turntable here as well. Here's another part of that same building. And this is where it was. This is the Hampton Preston House. Robert Mills House. This is Benedict College or Benedict University now. It's right here. And all these houses, this whole block adjacent to the Hampton Preston House um, was workers' houses. This is the 1872 bird's eye view map of Columbia. You're all probably familiar with it. Um, but it shows great detail. This was the passenger depot for Southern Railroad at that point in time. There was a depot here. And there was also a depot around where Wet Willys is when the train came around, so you could actually board here as well. So, great, great story. This building was torn down um, probably in the 50s, maybe earlier than that. I'm not sure. I haven't been able to find out exactly when it was torn down. They closed the shop. The railroads consolidated so many of their shops. This is Whitmire, and this is gone. And I put this in as a transition slide photograph to look at, because what we we'll want to look at is a water tank. Um, steam locomotives took a lot of water and a lot of coal to keep them operating. So there were literally, if not thousands, at least upper hundreds of water tanks around South Carolina. You figure there's 4,000 miles of track in 1920. Um, and you've got to have water tanks to steam, to steam locomotives. So they've got to be around. So there are lots of water tanks around. This one's in Whitmire. This one's in Valentine. And it's got a great motor car on it. By the way, these, several of these photographs from 1917, just to give you a quick aside, um, if any of y'all are Episcopalians, you know Bishop Waldo, and Andrew Waldo, who is a retired bishop of Upper South Carolina, just retired the end of the year. Last year, huge railroad buff. And he started um, when he was in Birmingham, where he grew up, 
um, studying railroad, working on railroads, he discovered at the National Archives a file of railroad photographs taken in 1917. What happened was the railroads were not properly paying taxes on the property they actually owned. So they required the railroads to photograph everything they owned, every building, including outhouses, and pay taxes on them. So there's this wonderful trove of photographs. Well, mostly, if you're trying to get copies of these photographs, you go to the National Archives, you have to fill out forms and all. Somehow or another, they got put into a set of records which were considered documents and not photographs. Photographs, you can't use your own scanner. If you're, doc if you're scanning documents, you can scan them. And so since they were considered that, he held their feet to the fire. So he has made 20 or so trips to D.C. He has several thousand photographs of Minnesota, which is where he was before he came to Columbia, and South Carolina when he came here, he started doing here, and Alabama. And they're great photographs that show you this, not the fabulous stations and the wonderful trains, but they show you the real working stuff. This is a 712. This is on the South Carolina at the, at the Railroad Museum. Um, this is in Ryan, South Carolina. This is a water tank. They put water in the tank. It's up on granite pillars because the railroad ran to granite. Ran to granite pillars. That's what its primary purpose was in history as well. This is the last steam air water tank standing trackside in South Carolina. And I've said that many times in presentations and we've gone on websites and Facebook asking railroad groups, asking people if they know of any more. Nobody does. So we think this is the last one still standing. Uh, from one side, it's kind of overgrown, but from the other side, we have cleaned it up and make sure people, and we talk about it when we go by it on the train so folks realize how significant it is. And coaling stations, they were all over. Not as fancy as this one, which was in a low country, but it's uh, typical of what you would have found. Totally gone. There's not another one standing in South Carolina, and very few standing in the country. This is at the Haines Shop in Spartanburg. Haines Shop in Spartanburg was Southern Railway's main maintenance facility in this part of the country. Um, and it closed in the 1980s or 1990s. But this is a car bender. One of the things that used to happen frequently was the cars would, if they were, if they were coupled too fast or something, it would bend the back end of the car. This was built to straighten them out in there as well. The whole main shop is gone, unfortunately, but this is one that's left. Um, this is Camden Junction, down there, actually 12 miles from Kingville. And again, it's got a motor car in it. Um, Andrew Walter sent me these. He actually sent me about a dozen photographs of these that had motor cars, since I have a motor car. He thought I'd like to have those, which is a, a great thing to have. But the reason I put this in was to show you the diamond, which is here. Now, the diamond in railroad terms is where trains, two different sets of tracks can cross. You can do that in three different ways. One, you can do a diamond. Or two, you can build a bridge and go over the top of it. This is what a diamond looks like. You can see it clearly here. This is not Camden Junction. This is just a generic diamond. But you can see it looks like a diamond. Or you can do what the people in Conway, South Carolina did and they built what's called a track elevation, I, can't, I can never remember the words, it's four, it's four words. This is how it works. This is one track running right here. This is the second track running right here. So when they want to use this track, they just pull with these pulleys this track up high enough so that the train can go under it, and then it comes back. Thing. Like a drawbridge. It's just like a drawbridge. I don't know why I never thought that before. And then, well, this is where it was located in Conway, right down on the Waccamaw River, if you're familiar with this part of Conway. There's a, I think there's a seafood restaurant right close to this, if I'm envisioning where this exactly was. And then there's lots of buildings that were associated with railroads, like this um, station master's house in Pendleton, South Carolina. Um, it were um, part of the property of the railroads and maintained and most of them sold off as the railroads wanted to own less materials as well. But things remain, the Green Pond Station is gone. 
But the coal-fired stove that heated it is still there. It's in the exhibit in the Jacqueline Railroad Museum in Winsboro. And the actual door on it says railroad. It was made specifically for railroad. This is not a caboose stove. This is, this is for inside of a building because um, it's got the little feet on it like this. As well, this is a representation of the um, Branchville Depot about 1960. And there's rolling stock still extant. This is a photograph of a dining car, number 3157 on Southern Railroad, taken in Washington, D.C. in 1949. Notice it still has this uh, steering on top. Uh, this was for ventilation because it had not had air conditioning been put in yet. Um, they took the car and renovated it completely in 1949. And it's currently at the South Carolina Railroad Museum. Notice the top is off. But the rest of it is pretty much the same. And we use this on our excursions in cooler weather. The air conditioning died about five years ago. It's going to cost us about $50,000 to replace it. So we've chosen to just run it in cooler weather for the moment anyway. Uh, we hope to get it back to full service as quickly as we can. This is, um, I tell the kids that come to the railroad museum, this is the corporate jet of the 1920s. Um, this is the executive vice president of Seaboard Airlines private car. Has three, three um, bedrooms in it with private baths in each one, dining room, a kitchen, porters area. It had a two-man crew, a porter and a waiter, um, and a cook who took care of them as well. This is on exhibit at the museum as well. Um, cabooses, this is a transfer caboose. And when I try to explain transfer cabooses to people, sometimes they don't understand. You see right behind me the real caboose, a nickel plate, by the way. Um, caboose right behind it. Um, this would have been run on the back of the trains, and the reason the cabooses were there was the, the conductor and the brakeman would sit at the bay windows or in the cupola, look the length of the train for any problems they were looking for. Um, axles that were having varying problems or whatever. So it would run cross country. The transfer cabooses were used for the crew, had a little house on it, so if the weather was inclement, they could be inside. But this would be used to transfer cars from the Columbia Yard at St. And uh, the Andrews Yard to the Casey Yard if it's going from Southern Railroad to Seaboard at that point in time. So it was a place for the crew to ride outside. So these did not go interstate or in great distances, but they were used in the yards. This was built at the Hain Shop in Spartanburg in the 1950s. They built about 20 of them. There's four of them still extant, and two of them at the Railroad Museum. What we've done with this one um, is we cleaned it up, we turned it into an open air car, you see the seats on it. And this past fall, we put a roof on it. Because riding outside in, in Winsboro in July and August can be a little warm with the sun beating down on you. But what we've not done is mess with the original fabric. That can be taken off and you've got, you've got your original caboose back, but um, for our purposes, it needed to have a roof on it. And then there's a velocipede with our track maintenance supervisor riding it. These were cars used by the maintenance crews on the track. Every so many miles of track would have a crew whose job it was to keep that track in good condition. And they would daily, or at least every couple of days, run that whole five miles of track. So the supervisor of that crew would use this and he'd mark where they needed to replace a tire or if they had a problem with the track, a bad piece of track, whatever it was. And it's a bike, basically. You pump it like this with your feet and your hands. And when we got this from Dylan, from a family named Stone, uh, who was a Seaboard Airline executive, um, we put it on the track and ran it. And it works fine, as long as you're not pumping it. This is Mr. Stone, he was, uh, his family gave it to us. And you see one of them here. These were, these were built in the 1870s and the 1880s and early 90s by the 1915 time period with the internal combustion engine. Um, we were beginning to get the cars with the motors in them. So these quickly disappeared and not many of them around. They're pretty scarce um, these days. Well, you can also, um, get railroad heritage by visiting some of the museums. We have three kind of railroad museums in the state, uh, and a fourth that's um, the best friend museum. This is in Charleston. Have y'all been to that? Next time you're in Charleston, if you're anywhere near the visitor center, which is this building right here, this is where the buses come through and pick you up for tours. Um, this is right across the little street 
And then it's open, it's got great exhibits on it. This is the model that was built in the 1920s um, for Southern. And it's got three, car, three cars, I believe, on it. It's some great exhibits around it as well. And anybody know where Hub City is? Greenwood, Green, Greenwood? Uh, Spartanburg. Spartanburg calls itself Hub City because it had three railroads that connected there, Southern, Clinchfield, and Seaboard um, as well. So the old, oh, part of the old, part of the depot has burned, but the part that's still there is the Hub City Railroad Museum. And they have exhibits on local transfer storage and, and uh, shipment of peaches. They've got a caboose. This is an older caboose. It's metal. Recognize that? This is Greenwood, South Carolina, the railroad, the railroad historical center. That locomotive, the, the number 19, was the main locomotive at the Rockland and Ryan from the 1930s till the 1960s. And when the Rockland and Ryan was closed by Martin Marietta, um, in the 1970s, they sold all the rolling stock and equipment. And Mr. Adams and Greenwood bought this, had it moved over by rail, had rail line laid from the track behind his house several hundred yards into his yard. And when he passed away, he left it to the town of Greenwood. Um, and they turned it into a museum. So they have our, they have our uh, one of our locomotives here as well. But they also had a great collection of cars from Piedmont and Northern. They've got a caboose, they've got the Carolina, which was their executive car for their president as well. Um, so you see this one, and they've got a, a coach car, a passenger car as well. And they're open on Saturdays. Don't just drive over there because they're not open all the time. They're open on Saturdays primarily. And then it's at the railroad museum in Winsboro. Our sort of signature piece is the 44. This was on the Hampton and Branchville Railroad built in 1924, uh, came to Hampton and Branchville, and it never left South Carolina until about five years ago when it went to Wilmington, North Carolina, to appear in the movie. Um, it didn't actually um, run. It was pushed to make it look like it was running, but uh, the movie people had more money than sense sometimes, so uh, they chucked it over there at great expense, so it's never ran under its own steam except in South Carolina. What's the date of that one? 1924. Well, as Andy said, we're going to introduce them to you. The Sackler Railroad Museum operates the Rock and Ryan Western, which is a tourist railroad. It's the core, it's the railroad that ran from in Rock and South Carolina, which is a connection with the Southern Railway, 12 and a half miles to the Anderson Granite Quarry, which is one that produces Winsboro Blue Granite, which is the official state stone. Good trivia question. Most people don't know that. And the only quarry it comes from is the Anderson Quarry. It's from, there's also a quarry at Ryan. Um, and right now we're on 11 and a half miles of track. We've restored a little over five of it and run excursions every Saturday during the summer. And especially this is Christmas trains. Um, this gives you an idea of uh, we've got five locomotives like this and passenger cars, open air cars. Uh, we've just acquired some. Um, cars that were used in interurban service in uh, Chicago and Washington. And though the Ringley Brothers and Roman Bailey Circus has not come to Winsboro, um, when they closed the circus in 2017, they put off 142 cars on, for sale at auction. And we bid on a couple of generator cars so we could put power on those high levels you looked at. Um, we didn't come close to winning generator cars. And about three weeks later, Ringling Brothers called us up and said, we want to give you four cars. So they gave us three cars, which were used to house the performers and the workers. One of them has three bedroom, has three room compartments in it. One has five. And the last one has 11 compartments. It was the clown car. The clowns lived in that car the last several years uh, that Barn Bailey ran. Right now, they're not on exhibit. Um, we're waiting until we get a generator car, which we're working to do so we can provide power to these, so we can put heat and air conditioning in them, because the windows don't open, so we can run it in mild weather. But if it's hot or cold, there's no air circulation, which is not fun. Um, so we're working on those. Or scout overnights, like they do at Yorktown. 
So we have some lot, thought of ideas what we can do with those columns. This is our museum gallery, which was a portable classroom which the county gave us 30 years ago. And we had it redone by students from the university's public history program about six years ago. They did all the panels and um, kind of some cases and so forth. So we keep adding a few new artifacts over here and there. Uh, dining car china, for example. Um, this southern seaboard dining car china, this intro or had its own china. We run steam every other year. We lease a steam locomotive like this and run excursions usually in the spring for about three or four Saturdays in a row. If you've never ridden behind steam or been around a steam engine, it's a great experience. Don't wear white. And that's the railroad museum, so keep an eye on that. Let me do just, uh, let me close a little bit on Casey. I mean, y'all maybe can help me with this. I cut, do y'all know Marty Cheney? Do you remember Marty Cheney? Marty's one of our railroad buffs, works at the railroad museum. Um, he you lives. Met him once, yes, really. Huh? You met him once, yes. Um, so, um, this is the southern station in Casey. This is long gone. Um, see, State Street is right behind me, a little bit, a little bit behind where the photograph was taken, according to Marty. And this track, I believe, is southern, and this track is seaboard. If I understood him right on the phone the other day when he was trying to tell me. And this is taken probably close to that station. This is the yard office for seaboard. Seaboard did not have a depot in this Casey. Um, so this is the yard office for Casey, and I think this is where the track goes across the river, across the bridges. I believe that's what we're looking at here. And this photograph was taken in 1968 by Mr. Roberts, who I mentioned earlier. Ginyard Brickworks um, had its own railroad. This is 1958 when one of the chimneys was collapsed. Fortunately, they didn't collapse the three kills, the four beehive kills, which are still there, and they're still sitting there. Um, in use with the, is this Grand New Station? Is that what this complex is called? It's right on the river, their apartments here. And of course, to the left now is a whole big slew of apartments which have been put in. Um, but what they've done is they've kept these, and I think the Ginyard family descendants, Charlie Thompson, principally, I think, is interested in trying to make this into a green space in a park. So we decided that we, we helped out with that. Um, Years ago, Ginyard gave the Railroad Museum one of the flat cars that they used to move bricks around on. I don't think this is a car that went from Columbia to Charleston or somewhere. I think this is one they used to move bricks around in the yard, maybe. It's got Ginyard brickworks on it. And it's got an unusual set of trucks on it called Fox Trucks, which are unique, apparently, in there as well. So we actually, um, several years ago, um, gave them this locomotive, um, which is at the railroad museum. It's a 45 ton of porter. Um, and let me see if I can switch something here and I'll show you the beginning of our railroad if I can make this work properly. Locomotive, but it's the same model as you know, it looks very similar. This is 1968. That's crossing 321. We now have this at the, at the museum. It's on file, or archive, or whatever. Huh? Y'all have this at the museum. It's now, this, this was this was taken by the gentleman. You'll see that's, that's his family. Not that time. That's his wife, Norma. They live right across from Ginyard Park okay. on Jasmine Street. And Howard is the gentleman. You'll see sitting in the cabin. This is coming back behind. 
I'm headed out to the seaboard line. We go to track and go. You want me to, you want me to name Howard Shepard? Yes, sir. Howard Shepard. He just passed away in December. And um, his life has given us all this. And you can see the right track goes up to the seaboard track. The other one goes on down to where the clay pits are. And went on down to where the clay pits are. That's where they dug the clay right. and brought it out. And there goes a passing between on the main line out there as they got down to the clay. Norma gave us um, all of Howard's videos. Um, so we, we had this, if y'all want to copy them on Yeah, that'd be great. And to put it in the exhibit, and we'll do the railroad exhibit. Um, yeah, there's still some real out there at the little clay pits. Yeah, yeah, I've seen it out there. The one hanging from the tree? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, cool. so that was that movie was probably taken in 19... 1968, 69 was about a legend. Did they get to the Did the video go to the No, no, it's almost over now. In fact, interestingly enough, the number on that is five, which is the same number as the one we did. Each railroad numbered their locomotives separately, so it does not like it came out of the factory. That's Howard right there. Okay, and that's the end of it. This is another trial. He was doing hiring with a big trial doctor for him. So that's kind of it. I'm just going to try and answer any questions if you have them. So, well, I mean, it's. It's amazing to me that, that, like you said, there's 270 trains, you know, moving through the city of Columbia. And then you got to think, you multiply that throughout the state, you know, and trains are moving a lot of commerce and a lot of mail and a lot of people um, to various points and whatnot. Um, so I'm wondering, you, you know, you talk about some of these being turned into like parks and things like that. Um, is there is there one especially now that would be kind of the neat one that, that, that you know no one's really working on or no one's it's been abandoned or whatever that they want to turn into like one of those little parks where you could walk to I guess the railroad bed or whatever? Yeah, no, none of them. Unfortunately, Port Royal, um, none of those have worked out that way. You know, the, the best one if you're ever in. Um, Hershey, Pennsylvania, uh, well, not Hershey, uh, York, Pennsylvania area, New Freedom, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, a new tourist railroad called um, North Central Railroad. Um, it started like a couple of years ago as a speed into history, but they changed their name because it, it runs on what was the North Central Railroad, ran from Baltimore to Harrisburg um, through York, and they stationed themselves in New Freedom. And it was a double track line. So what has happened is one track was taken up years ago and one track was left. And the town of York and other groups have, have purchased the right of way. And so now you've got the trains on one track and you've got mom pushing the stroller with the baby right beside it. So it works great. They paid one track and the other one's still working. Of course, they run at 8, 9, 10, 12, 15 miles an hour, so it's not like they're going to rush by mom and whatever. But that's the greatest example I've seen. It, it serves both purposes. It's a great, it's a great ride through four or five little towns. Mm. Um, and they're going to go all the way from New Freedom to New York, which is a total of about 25 miles. So far, they've got about 16 or 18 of it done. Um, but that's the best example I've seen. Um, nothing in South Carolina. Um, one of, one of the neat things that the Adirondack Museum in Adirondack here in New York, Railroad Museum up there, they have started using rail bikes. They have a company that makes rail bikes where you can put two or three or four people in them, like tandem with pedals, so you pedal yourself. There's no, no other power but you. And we're trying to see if we can get one of them down here to ride on that other end of our track 
so we can go out there and keep the trees cut and all that without having to worry about if you're able to bike, you can easily pick it up and put it back on the track. I've got two more questions for you. So the coal that all these trains consumed, was that that was outside of the state, mostly imported to the state, like yeah. from West Virginia and places like that? Yeah, the Norfolk and Western Railroad, which ran out of, out of West Virginia and Southern Western Virginia, had several trains a day that went from the mountains down to the coast to exports for coal as well. And that was one of the main things that Norfolk and Western was doing um, before they merged with Southern. Coal traffic is way down. I mean, what's, what's, what's building up the railroads right now is the interloper, where they stack the containers. You look at a train, I don't want to get you all too late. Um, I said I like talking about railroads. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things the railroads have done, if you take a look at the containerized freight that goes through, each one is double stacked. That's two trucks. That's two trucks on Interstate 26 that are not running on Interstate 26 because they're on the trains. They're now using what they call um, time destination railroading, which is what they do is they try and time it just right. So instead of running two trains with a two-man crew of 80 or 90 or 100 cars, they're running one train with a two-man crew with 200 cars. There are trains running that are three miles long. And they have what they call distributed power units in the middle, which are radio controlled. So they're co connected up with the throttle. So in the lead engine, when the engineer goes to throttle 76, that goes to throttle 76. Because the biggest problem they have with those long trains is, um, as you can imagine, you've got part of the train going downhill and part of the train coming uphill. Imagine the pressure that's putting on the couplers. So they were having lots of couplers break. So by putting a train engine in the middle somewhere, that takes the pressure off of that. So, again, so if you sit at a crossing and see a train go by with a locomotive in the middle, there's nobody in that middle or the end. They've been using pushers for years on the back end to get up steep hills and mountains and all. They use pusher engines. These are now radio controlled. So you've got a two-man crew running a train it's got 200 cars on it, which is equivalent to 400 trucks. Think of all the gas pollution we would not have if those were all on trains. There's intermodal trains that run from Charleston overnight through Columbia to, Green, to Spartanburg to Greer. There's an inland port in Greer. They started out running one train, and I understand they're going to two trains now. If they'll start running two trains a night, nobody ever knows it because they go through town at night. It's about a six or eight hour trip from Charleston up to Greenville. Um, so, one thing I'm curious about with, um, say, the 19 teens, 20s, 30s, and the truck farming that was um, happening along the, the railroad. Uh -huh. You know, what, one of the trains, say, it stops in a, you know, a, a truck farming town, and you, know, you show the, the freight depot. What kind of uh, labor gets mobilized to get everything on the train and, and off the train and kind of, I don't know. What the, what the primary would be doing, you saw in a couple of those pictures of the depots I had, you saw some freight cars, bag box cars sitting around. They would preload those, so they were already loaded. Okay. So when the train came, all they had to do was couple them okay. and take off with them as well. Um, and sometimes they even have them like in Seabrook, I think there was a siding at Seabrook where the farmer himself had his own sort of depot where you know, they would leave cars there for him to fill them up, and then they'd pick them up on the next train when it was scheduled. Certainly. So they were using uh, whatever labor they could get, um, and a lot of it was African American labor, of course, truck farming um, in the lower part of the state was pretty extensive. Um, we got that in even things like the backup from ship by rail. Anybody else have any questions? Well, we really want to um, thank Dr. Strick for coming and giving this presentation. It's been really interesting. Here's a little token from the KC Museum. Thank you. Um,
and given this our, our 100th uh, anniversary year was in 2014, so it dates the panel of cases right for you. Thank you so much for coming here. Yeah. All right.